And as the God gives our hard direction in terms of the way that we should go, as we wait on the Lord for that, we call attention to message, a message, our messengers, messages that may be appropriate for the moment. This church and our family has certainly gone through some trying moments uh, in several losses uh, within our church family. I heard just the other day of passing of another relative associated with a member of our family, Sister Madravia, uh, and I think it was a niece who passed away after childbirth. So in all of this, in all of this, we still trust our lives and our well-being to the God who does all things well. Amen. I want to call attention to a passage that I think is appropriate for this moment that was read in your hearings. From 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 3 to 11. A time in the life of the Apostle Paul that Paul describes as his most darkest hour. When literally as one who would be considered very close to our Lord. One who is responsible for the majority of the writing of New Testament documents. One who has said that God by his grace, made him what he was and what he is. But yet in this moment, going through a very season of his life, he experienced deep despair, in which he said he was driven to the point where he literally wanted to surrender his life. But God helped him through that very distressful and trying time. I've chosen as a subject for this message getting through it all. We live in a world that consists of transitions. All of us, for all of us, life is about transitions that we have to make at one time or another. Life consists of ups and downs, ins and outs. We often ask questions in the midst of the most difficult times. We often ask the question of why. Why is it that uh, sometimes innocent people suffer? Why is it that we experience pain and suffering and, dis and despair and all of those things in a world that God is superintendent of? And I want to say that most of what we experience as human beings in our pilgrimage of life has to do with the fact that we are living in a broken world. 
Nothing is perfect. There are no perfect relationships. There are no perfect marriages. There are no perfect careers. Nothing about our existence is perfect. You're not going to get through this life always feeling good. You may have to visit the hospital every once in a while. Uh, and that's all because we are living in an imperfect and in a broken world. And somebody said, well, why, why is that? Why is it that we... Why is it that the world has to be imperfect and why is it that the world has to, that life has to consist of the vicissitudes, the ups and the downs and the ins and the outs, the good and the bad? I'll tell you why. Because God chose to make us free moral agents. God gave us the freedom to choose. And the problem is, we often make stupid choices. That's right. We often make stupid choices. And it's, and it's a sad commentary because a lot of times what we experience has much to do with the choices that we make. And after we make those choices and experience the consequence of those choices, we like to blame God. Oh, it was God's will. We kill ourselves with choices that we make and then blame God, talking about God's will. Lord, Lord, let God's will be done. When in reality, your situation, your health, your disease, and sometimes your death is because by your fault. Are you hearing me? In other words, if we choose to put poison in our mouths, we choose to do those things that cause disease and sickness and all of this, don't turn around and blame God. God made us free. When we give ourselves heart attacks from overeating and all of those things, don't turn around and blame God. Because God is not responsible. God gave you the choice to determine what you're going to put in your mouth. God gave you the ch choice, choices to make that could be good and evil and try to give you guidance in terms of making the right choice. And even in spite of all the revelation that God gives us, we end up making the wrong choices. Why does God give us freedom to make these choices and he gives us freedom because he wants us to love him and love operates only out of freedom in other words in order to love you have to be free anybody nobody can command you to love we react against stuff like that even if you love and somebody try to put stipulations on you in that way, you tend to react to that because love operates out of freedom. God made us free to choose him or to not to choose him. And inasmuch as many have chosen not to love God, we often suffer consequences of not having a relationship to the one who created us in his own image. Sometimes we suffer because of bad choices that we make. And other times we, we suffer because of bad choices of people around us. That's right. We can find ourselves in trouble because of the choices that people that we are interacting with. That's why the Bible says you need to choose. You need to be careful about choosing your intimates. We live in a world that's broken. And we suffer because of the brokenness 
of creation, the Bible says because of sin, the whole creation is groaning. So God knew what we would face, and yet he has a way of making all things work together. God has a way of working even our bad choices to serve cosmic and holy purposes of God. But I want to take God's word and I want to take this passage in Paul's season. The season that he is going through in his life as he writes this passage. He gives us and exposes us to principles that existed in his life that helped him to get through it all. And I want to talk about today how to get through what you're going through. Last week we dealt with persistence in prayer. and That is to say, keep on praying. Prayer is so much, is not so much for the ears of God as it is for your own ears, but keep on praying. Don't give up. Before you look up. And in this text, I want to say that there are things that you need, principles that you need as a guide in the light that comes from the Word of God that will help you go through what you're going through. And one of the first principles uh, in this passage, and we're not going to read it again. But one of the first principles of this text is that you have to remember how to get through it. Number one, you have to remember that God can use your pain. God can use your situation for good. There are many ways that God uses our problem. Do you not know the text? The word teaches us that he uses our problems to direct us, to correct us, to inspect us. You know, I know sometimes God allow you to be shaken up in order for you to know what's in you. He knows what's in you, but sometimes you don't know what's in you. And sometimes we have to put ourselves with, God has to allow us to get in the heat, get in the fire, or get over the fire so we can see what comes out. You are like tea bags. You don't know what's in it until you put it in the hot water. Then you see what comes out. Sometimes it takes the fire that's essential in order to inspect us. To correct us. Sometimes problems in our lives are designed to protect us. If you never went through a particular circumstance or situation. You, don't, you would not know that you need to avoid it. Sometimes we experience problems as a means of protection. God allows us to go through problems as a means of protection. Not only protection, but to edify. And sometimes the Bible said to purify, to sanctify our lives. There are many ways that God uses problems. Correction, protection, inspection, purification, there are many ways that God can use problems in your life. But notice in this text, we find three that Paul found and makes mention of. Number one, God uses problems to develop, to develop my faith. You don't know you need God many times until he's all you got. Sometimes you don't realize your need for the Lord until the Lord is all that you have. A songwriter once wrote, if I never had a problem, I would not have known that God could solve them. Isn't that right? Oh well, yes, that was Andre Crouch. The point is, God uses problems as a means of developing our faith. Notice in this text, Paul said we were crushed, completely overwhelmed, and we thought we would never live through it. 
In fact, we expect it to die, but as a result, we learn to not rely upon ourselves, but on God who can raise the dead. God can raise us. He can lift us up when we think that all is a loss. When we find ourselves in total despair of our lives, God is capable, the Bible says, of raising us up. Some things we only learn as a result of pain. Do you not know it doesn't matter how much the parent tell the child, don't touch that, that's hot, don't touch it. The child touches it anyway and learn the lesson that there are things that you need to stay away from. There are things that we learn only as a result of our pain. And then the second thing about God using, remembering how that God can use it for good, not only to develop our faith, but to discover your ministry. Do you not know that he turns many times what we might say he'll turn your mess into your message. He'll turn your discomfort into a means by which you are capable of ministering to others. Notice he says God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. Who's better to help somebody going through a financial crisis better than a person who has gone through it themselves? Who's better to help somebody overcome and deal with addiction better than the person who has gone through addiction and recovery themselves? Who's better to help somebody dealing with physical ailment an affliction better than that person who has gone through it and overcome it themselves. God gives us ministry many times through our pain and through our problems. In other words, he, the Bible said, through your pain, you discover your purpose. God specializes in bringing good out of bad. Oh, yes, he does. Paul says, when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your benefit and salvation. For when God comforts us, it is so that we in turn can be an encouragement to you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffered. That's why people have parents. That's what the value of parenting is. Amen. That's why it's so important to listen to parents. Yes. Because they have already been the path. They can tell you what to avoid. I've been down that road. And I can tell you that you need to make a detour. Isn't that right? I sit through a, I sit through a session. We conducted a symposium here through the sorority links on human trafficking and I sit and heard a young lady tell her story a young lady that was going through college working on a master's degree grew up right here in the valley grew up in a very guarded family situation she talked about that and then she went on off to college and graduated went back into graduate school but was trying and longing to meet the man of her life, but met the wrong person. Amen. Someone who convinced her ultimately to start selling her body. You know, she told a very moving story. Amen. But now she's making lectures everywhere, trying to warn young ladies. Warn young ladies of these type of encounters. How to beware. Many times parents want to uh, get away from their children for a while and drop them off at the mall. And she's saying, you need to know that the pimps are there too. That's why they make contact. You know, yeah, they're there. And they're waiting on you to drop off your daughters at the mall. 
need to be aware of what's going on on social media. Sometimes parents need a false page. That's right. So you can follow where your daughters are going on the web. Isn't that right? Your young kids are going. The point is who can better help another person but somebody who has suffered the same fate. And I tell you that Paul is saying it is often through our problems, it is often through our pain that God helps us to discover our ministry, the way in which he intends us to help others. Notice not only uh, does he use his problems as a means, you need to remember that God can use it for good to develop my faith, to discover my ministry, but also to draw me in communion with others. In other words, God can use my ministry for redemptive suffering. Come on, help me now. That's not it. <laughs> the point is uh, that Paul is saying, you know, God made us for community. He made us for relationships. But we get so caught up in our activities, our achievements, our accomplishments, and we become what one might describe as independent minded. And we think everything's all right. I don't need others. I don't need others in the church. I don't need community. I don't need fellowship. Because we feel like we're doing all right by ourselves. But God knows that you are not wired that way. God made you in his image. God made you to be associated and in community with others. But you have allowed the facades of life, achievements and accomplishment to make you, in other words, to develop in you an independent man. And the Bible says, but what God does God, he will rescue you. Notice he said he rescued us because you are helping by praying for us. Now notice Paul is saying we need the prayers of others. As a result, many will give thanks to God because so many people's prayers for our safety have been answered. You need to have interdependence on other believers. That's the way God designed it. Whether you think you're doing all right, God sometimes will allow you to experience problems that you can't solve. Where you need somebody else coming alongside of you, praying with you, praying for you. There's a power in fellowship. There's a power in community. Let me tell you something. And that's why we want everybody. We encourage everybody. You need to be in a group relationship. You need to be in a small group fellowship because it's so important. Help me move this forward, Diallo. In other words, there are always levels of community. And that's what small groups introduce us to. First of all, the fellowship of sharing. You know, that's the lowest level when we get together and you can just talk about things that are going on in your day, things that are happening with your family, things that are happening in your life, that's a value. You need to share your life with others. That's the first level of group relationship. It's called the fellowship of sharing. But then there's another level that groups take you to, and that is the fellowship of studying together. That's when you go deeper in God's word discover principles that make your life better, that give you guidance, and it draws you closer to other believers when you can experience the fellowship of study. And then let me tell you something. There's a deeper level, and that's called the fellowship of sharing. When groups can work together, pick a project, doesn't matter what it is, helping people who are homeless, going to a shelter, doesn't matter what it is, some ministry in the church, when you find yourself working together with other believers in accomplishing God's will, 
It takes you to a different level, or even a deeper level of community. Some groups have never gotten to that. They stay on the surface level, just sharing, or even that second level of just talking about the word, but never learn the deepness and the richness of applying that in working together with others to accomplish the will of God. And then, but let me tell you the deepest level, and that is the fellowship of suffering. You know, the fellowship of suffering. When you go through something in your life, let me tell you something. You can do two things. You can, number one, when God is doing things and you can see God's hand at work and is giving you joy, you can double your joy. Yeah, it's like that chewing gum, double your pleasure. When you share that when others can share that joy in your life. But then there's an opposite thing. When you're experiencing a burden, anytime you share your burdens with others, you are literally dividing the load. Isn't that right? You can make your burdens a lot lighter when you can share those burdens with others. The Lord himself says that I'll be your burden bearer. He said, come unto me all you have labor and the heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn about me. Find me lowly and hard and you'll find rest unto your souls. God gives us other believers in order that we might share our burden. Divide, divide the pain. Share it with others. You'll find in the fellowship of sharing the very deepest relationship that you can have but God made you for relationship God made you for community regardless of how you might feel at the moment I tell our leaders you know all of us literally are in small group relationships you know even in leadership we we meet every week that's a small group relationship but we encourage leaders to lead their groups to lead groups in order that others in the church might benefit from the benefit of fellowship and can have that blessing in their life. We can have the kind of community that glorifies God. Notice the prince of the third principle, or the second principle, is to refuse, refuse to listen to your fears. Refuse to listen to your fears. Notice, you know, when you get into trouble, fear naturally will surface. It'll talk to you. If you start talking back to your fears, that's something called worry. And you know, God wants you to choose your faith over fear and one thing about this and I want to give you some advice about going about implementing this principle when you find yourself worrying and that's listening to fear I want to tell you as your minister I want to tell you to do two things I want you to do two things number one I want you to schedule it. That's right. When it comes to worry, schedule it. <laughs> Just put it on your calendar. Say, well, at 7 o'clock tonight, I'm going to worry from 7 to 7.05. <laughs> That's right. Just schedule it. The point is, you don't want to mess up your whole day worrying about stuff you can't do nothing about. <laughs> That's right. Don't mess up your whole day ruminating, going over and over in your mind about stuff you can't do nothing about. So what you do when you find yourself fear, fearing and, 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 and ruminating, say, so, well, hold, hold it. This ain't my time to worry. That's right. The first thing I want you to do is schedule it. The second thing I want you to do is limit it. 
give it five minutes. <laughs> Say from 7 to 7.05, tonight I'm going to worry. It's all right to worry, just limit it. From 7 to 7.05, worry. I don't care if you could have a holy fit, panic attack, whatever, just have it at 7 o'clock. I'll, 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 I'll schedule 7 o'clock to 7 05, and that's it. I'm not even going to allow it to, 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 to make me lose sleep. Schedule it. Don't waste time. Limit it. Give yourself five minutes a day. Principle. Notice Paul says in this text, I think you ought to know, dear brothers about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed completely, overwhelmed. We feared we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die as a result. We learned, now notice he said, but as a result, we learn not to rely on ourselves. And so this brings you to the third principle of overcoming or getting through what you're going through and that is rejoice praise God in spite of your circumstance isn't that right you have to learn how to worship you have to learn how to praise God in spite of what you're going through notice the Bible says that you ought to rejoice in the Lord always he says, again, I say, rejoice. And what that is saying to you is, now he's not telling you to rejoice for your circumstance. In other words, tell God, oh, I'm glad I got cancer. I'm glad. That, that makes you a masochist. No, he's not telling you to rejoice for your circumstance. He's saying rejoice in the Lord. That's right. You've got to rejoice. You've got to learn how to rejoice in all circumstances, not for them. Amen. Notice 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It said, give thanks in what? All circumstances, for this is the will of God. You want to know what God's will is? God's will is that you praise God. Amen. That's right. I don't care what you're going through. There's always things that you can praise God about. And you know what you can praise God? Notice the Bible said, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. Whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Do you not praise in God, rejoicing? That's a choice you make. You can choose to praise God. And notice it said rejoice not in your trouble, but in the Lord. Isn't that right? It didn't say rejoice for your circumstance. It said rejoice in all circumstance. And then it says when you find yourself in trouble and in problems, the Bible says choose to rejoice. That's right. Choose to rejoice. And I'm going to tell you why. Because no matter what your problem, you can choose to rejoice because number one, God knows about it. That's right. And God cares. Yes, he do. God cares about you, and he cares about your circumstance. Oh, yes, he does. And God can direct you in it. God can direct you. He can perfect you. He can correct you. He can purify you. All of these things God is able to do with your troubles. In Romans 8, the Bible said God is able to make all grace abound toward us, that we can have sufficiency in every good work. The Bible says God uh, can make all things work together. That's the text I was. God can make all things work together for the good of them who love God. And for those who are called according to his pleasure, according to his plan. We know that. And if you know that God works things out for your good. He didn't say everything that happened in your life will be good. He said he can work it out for your good. Isn't that right? He can make it work together for your good. That's what God is able to do as a cosmic ruler of the universe. He is not going to take away suffering out of the world because it's necessary. He's not going to take away the consequence of human uh, wickedness and bad choices because it's necessary. 
But I tell you what, when it comes to the child of God, he can make all this stuff work together for your good. Amen. Oh, yes, he can. He can make it work out for your good. The Bible said for those who, whom he called uh, because of his plan in our lives, God is capable of doing that. And then the last thing, not the last thing, almost. <laughs> Notice... Here's another principle Paul says. You need to recruit others to pray for you. When you're going through problems, recruit others to pray. You know, and that's easily accomplished when you're in a small group relationship. Notice that God will rescue us because you are helping by praying for us. You know, I don't know what it is, but God has a way. There's something about group prayer that's powerful. Do you not know when you are not in a relationship of fellowship with others, you don't have the strength that other people have in the church because you are acting alone. When you act in concert and in fellowship and in communion with others, do you not know when other people are praying, you are not just praying, but other people are praying for you, there's power in group prayer. Oh, yes, it is. And there is additional, there is additional power when you have folk and when you ask people and recruit people to pray for you. Let me tell you, one of the powers is the power of confirmation. Do you not know the Bible says this? Notice he says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And you know what the law of Christ is? Love others like you are loving yourself. That's what the law of Christ is. And the Bible says when you are sharing your burden and you are carrying the burden of others, you are praying for others, the Bible says you are literally fulfilling the law of Christ. And notice again, the power that's associated with group prayer is what I call the power of confirmation. Sometimes you may think that what you're praying for is in harmony with God's will, but the Bible says you need to get other folk who possess the spirit of God to agree with you. You may think you have found the right relationship. Man, I found the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. You need to ask a couple of other folk. They might tell you different. Yes. <laughs> Not just anybody. The Bible says those who possess the spirit of God. Isn't that right? That's, right. That's, a, that's a serious charge. That's a serious decision. Isn't that right? There are folks who see things that you can't see because of your blindness. You know, I'm so in love. Oh, I just, oh, my heart is just hurting. I never felt it like this before. Jesus says, again, I say unto you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will, do, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. See, God does not simply arbitrarily answer prayer. He doesn't answer simply because it's good weather outside or he just feels good on that day. No. God knows exactly when and what prayer to answer. That's right. He knows when prayer is in harmony with his will. And, and, and one of the reasons that he gives the church, he, puts in, he deposits his spirit in the church. The Bible says because many times we don't know what we ought to be praying for. There are things in our heart that we don't even have the words to express, but the Holy Spirit in us, the Bible says, is uttering and interceding and, 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 and talking to God because the Spirit of God is in us and the Spirit in us is talking to the God of heaven expressing the desires of our heart but that Spirit is not just in you it's in other believers and that's why the Bible says if if any of you agree on anything is touching that you shall ask it will be done that is, if you got two people, you got three people all filled with the Holy Spirit and you've asked them and they're telling you, yes, I know that's God's will for your life, then pray about it. And the Bible says, and it shall be done. That's confirmation. Let me tell you something about in our, in our administrative staff, we were getting ready and we've been planning and getting ready 
for the spiritual growth campaign that we do out at the first of every year. And, and we put forward several curriculums, you know, uh, for the small group spiritual growth campaign. And I want to be saying to you at this time, you need to be getting ready and getting connected to a small group so you can experience the benefits of spiritual growth through this 40 days of spiritual growth that we do in the beginning of every year. Amen. And so we were laying out curriculums. We were saying this is this and this. And I asked the staff in the beginning, I said, now what curriculum do you think? You know, we need to, we need to go with and for every one of them, I got a different answer. I think we ought to do this one. Another, I think we ought to do this one. I had them text, text me their answers. And, and they text their answer to me. I didn't have them in group. I, they just text their answer to me. And all of them was different. Every one of them was different. And I said, I came back the next, next day. I said, this is what we're going to do. I said, we're not going to choose a curriculum right now. We're going to pray. And we're going to fast over this. It's very important for this church. And so we're going to pray. And we're going to fast for 24 hours about this curriculum. And on Wednesday, we're going to come back. On Thursday, we're going to come back and make the choice. And so we prayed and fasted, you know, all day, 24 hours, and came back on Thursday. And we met in my office. And I asked him, I said, I don't want you to say nothing. I just want you to write down your choice on a sheet of paper and give it to me. And every one of those staff persons gave me their choice. And guess what? It was all the same. They were all on the same page. See, that's power. Isn't that right? That's power in prayer. See, God knows what he wants for this church. And sometimes we need to be still long enough to listen long enough for God to tell us. Isn't that right? But there's power in group prayer. That's all I'm saying. You know, I thought, we thought we all had the answer. We just going on our own, our own desires and our own thinking. But when we decided to consult with God, yeah. isn't that right? All of us ended up on the same page. The point is, then let me tell you, when you're in a problem, the last thing that you can do is reaffirm reaffirm your faith in God. You see, one of the things, one of the differences between a mature and an immature believer, immature believers will walk away when things don't go their way. That's right. They can't imagine. You can't imagine. That is, I've been praying, and I've been praying for my sick relative. I've been praying for this person, you know, the, who got this particular problem, and I've been praying. And if God chooses not to answer, a lot of times people get angry with God, get upset, and just walk away. That's immature faith. But when you have mature faith, that's Jobian faith. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He said, all the days of my appointed time, I'm going to wait for my change to come. Isn't that right? In other words, he said, I'm not going to let anything separate me, Paul said, from the love of God. I'm not going to let anything hide death, perils, threats to my life. I'm not going to let anything separate me from the love of God. In other words, you have got to have that kind of faith that says, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. And in, tenth, in the 10th verse, Paul says, and we are confident that he will continue to deliver us. That is, that's a reaffirmation of faith. The strength of faith coincides, let me tell you, with how much deposit of God's word you allow into you. See, some of you never study God's word. and The only sermon, the only word you get is on Sunday. That's like eating or having a banquet on Sunday and fasting all week. You wonder why you are so unhealthy. Friends, you, you, you have to let God's word into your life on a regular basis. You need to meditate on God's word on a daily basis. Isn't that right? You know, meditate on God's word and allow God's word to germinate and bring forth fruit unto God. Faith comes by hearing, the Bible says. And that hearing is based on the word of God. To the extent that you take in the word, 
will be the extent to which you will have strong versus weak faith. So I want you to stand on your feet now. I want you to understand in finality, rely upon the promises of the word. Rely upon what God has stated in his word. There are over 6,000 promises that's in God's word that relate to every aspect of your life. It relates to your, your family. It relates to your physical life, your emotional health, your financial well-being. Over 6,000 promises. They're like blank checks that God gives you. You understand the premises, that you can fulfill the premises, then you'll experience the promise. But you need to know what's in that word. And you need to rely upon his promises. Because they're designed to encourage you. Notice the Bible says everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. The scripture give us endurance and encouragement so that we can have hope. There may be somebody right now that's literally going through the fire. I don't know what you may be experiencing, but you may be going through the fire. Let me give you just one promise that can be a takeaway from this message. James says God will bless you. And if you don't give up when your faith is being tested, he said he will reward you with the crown of life just as he rewards everyone who loves him. Friends, if there's a takeaway from this message today, the first thing I want to say to you, or what I want to say to you, you need to get in a group relationship. You need to get with people, put some people around you that can help you grow, that can rebuke you when you need rebuking, that can encourage you when you need encouraging that can hold you up when you need holding up, that can pick you up when you need picking up. You need not go through this journey by yourself. God didn't make you that way. Decide today that I'm going to get in a small group relationship. I want to recruit people that will pray for me and help me and encourage me and do all those things. That's necessary. Now, if you're outside of the fellowship of the body of Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to make a decision today. To be in fellowship with the Lord. Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. If you'll just hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and have fellowship with you. But you have to hear, and when you hear, you have to open the door. That's what God wants you to do. It's just as simple as that. I wouldn't go another day if I were you. A guilty distance from the Lord. And if there's anything about your salvation and about your life that raises questions, about your loyalty to Jesus as Lord of your life, that I want to encourage you to correct it. You need to do that today. The Bible says obedience to the gospel. Peter says baptism is the answer to a good conscience made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He can give you a good conscience. If you wandered away from the Lord wandered away from the fellowship. Why don't you return today? Let the church know that I'm back. That I'm back. I've returned to the house of God. Where there's bread enough to spare. Make your decision today. Make that decision right now. You'll walk down this aisle and give, just take a seat on the front row. You're seeking to place membership. You're seeking to be baptized. You're seeking to be restored. Then we want to give you that opportunity.
while we sing. 